Uh, and welcome to this lunchtime session uh, hosted by the Mason Institute for Medicine, Life Sciences and the Law. My name is Jared Porter and I'm a lecturer at Edinburgh Law School in Medical Law and Ethics. Uh, and we're delighted to welcome today Dr. Mark Fleer from the School of Law at Queen's University of Belfast uh, to talk about the very interesting and topical subject of uh, clinical trials abroad. And uh, we'll uh, hand over to Mark. We'll talk for about 25, 30 minutes or so. I'll have a quick uh, response for about five minutes or so, and then we can open the floor for, for questions. So thank you. you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for coming. I don't often go to so uh, well-populated seminars, so <laughs> it's quite impressive, actually. Um, or at least outside of human rights and criminology, it means the, the seminars aren't so well <laughs> participated. Um, so uh, that's Queen's. I'm here. So hi. Uh, the talk then is uh, entitled EU Law and International Clinical Trials um, and what I try to do towards the end of the paper is sketch out a route towards strength and protection for research subjects, so uh, the subjects that are included in international clinical trials. And before I go into the talk, I'm just going to set the broad context for it. Um, if you want to ask me some questions about why I've chosen this uh, later, then please do. But I'm going to just highlight a few things. Now, uh, clinical trials. Um, why clinical trials? Well, they're really important. They're essential, in fact. The data uh, produced by clinical trials for the authorization of drugs or pharmaceuticals uh, in the market. Uh, within the EU, that's on the EU's internal market. So we need clinical trials data in order to demonstrate that pharmaceuticals are both safe and they work, in, or in other words, they are efficacious and can therefore uh, be put onto the market and purchased. Uh, clinical trials are then very, very important, but they haven't really been a core focus of look, uh, working law. Uh, typically, when we look at... Uh, Outside of law, though, there's been an awful lot of attention to clinical trials and to pharmaceuticals. Uh, we can see that in anthropology. There are a few uh, anthropological works for us there. Also sociology, uh, to some extent so, uh, science and te technology studies. So we can see a focus on pharmaceuticals and clinical trials in those particular disciplines. But within those disciplines, there's little, if any attention given to the European Union. I would say, just as a bit of a footnote, that there is growing attention to clinical trials and pharmaceuticals uh, in law, but that focuses <coughs> on law at the national level. So I'm thinking in particular on Emily Jackson's recent work. Uh, but nevertheless, that work doesn't really focus on the EU either. So in this paper, I want to draw attention to the European Union as a really important site for examining clinical trials and some of the problematic aspects or dimensions around them. The talk proceeds as follows. I'm going to start off by drawing out a few of the links between public health, so pharmaceuticals, pharma uh, the resort of pharmaceuticals are really important for public health. Clinical trials then as the basis for the market authorization of pharmaceuticals, in particular within the EU's internal market. So I'm going to tease out some links I'm also going to tease out some tensions between those things, between public health, between clinical trials and market authorisation. After which I'm going to turn to highlight a few uh, key ethical concerns around the use of international research subjects in order to produce data through clinical trials for market authorisation within the EU's internal market. And then finally I'm going to sketch out a few ways that I think uh, protections four research subjects might be strengthened. So that's the final part of the talk. So hopefully you can see that okay, it looks, it looks fairly clear to me. Um, so to begin with then, public health protection. Public health protection is reflected, uh, it's crystallised in several provisions that are core to the EU's legal order. In particular, we can see it reflected in Article 35 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which, post-Treaty uh, of Lisbon, 
now has equal standing to the treaties. The Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union in particular, mentioned next in Article 9 and Article 114, Paragraph 3. This focus, then, is on ensuring a high level of public health protection. So if I just look at Article 35, that shall be ensured in the definition and implementation of all of the Union's policies. Article 9, uh, public health protection shall be taken into account. So that's a more concrete instantiation of Article 35. And we see this idea, then, being reflected again in Article 114, in particular in paragraph 3, which requires that the European Commission take as a high base, uh, a high level of protection of, among other things, health in internal market legislation, which is adopted on the basis of Article 114. Now that legislation, or some of the legislation, is actually mentioned below. The legislation I'm talking about today, that's the starting point for this talk, is internal market legislation. It's not legislation adopted under the, the, the final treaty provision, Article 168 TFEU, which does provide for the adoption of, in particular, incentive measures in relation to public health. So that's then a set of key provisions in the treaties and in the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights, mentioning a high level of health protection as a core, a core matter for EU law, for EU regulation. In terms of EU legislation, there are a number of pieces of legislation to highlight, and I'll just describe them in the following way. The first that's listed is the Community Code relating to medicinal products for human use. That requires that clinical trials data is the basis for the authorisation, for the licensing of pharmaceuticals for circulation within the EU's internal market. There's a focus there then, and I will stress this again later, on ensuring that uh, Pharmaceuticals are both safe and they work, they are efficacious. We've got the Clinical Trials Directive then, which provides uh, for some limited harmonisation of clinical trials. There's a further concretising uh, in relation to uh, clinical trials then, in relation to ensuring good clinical practice. So there are further efforts, but this is uh, still rather minimal harmonisation. Now, these pieces of law that in the second uh, to last bullet point are largely duplicated in the new clinical trials regulation. So there is going to be uh, the replacement then of the clinical trials directive uh, next year, though, at, at, at least, or at soonest rather, next year, we will have the clinical trials regulation in operation. That becomes important later on. Now, I just want to bring out then a little more, going beyond those provisions, this uh, relationship or, this, or the kinds of relationships that are between pharmaceuticals, public health and industry in EU law. So the very first directive that I noted uh, on the previous slide states the following in the recital, that the essential aim of any rules governing the production, distribution and use of medicinal products must be to safeguard public health. So that seems to be reflective of those initial provisions, doesn't it? Those, those provisions uh, in the treaties, in the Charter. But then in the directive, in the following, the immediately following recital, we have this. But this objective must be attained by means which will not hinder the development of the pharmaceutical industry or trade in medicinal products within the community. That's these days the European Union, it's renamed. <clears throat> so, I think this highlights, there are other examples, it highlights though fairly clearly a particular relationship between public health protection, uh, pharmaceuticals, and industry. More, moreover, we can see that there is an alignment of clinical trials to market authorisation. The focus then of market authorisation, as I've said, is on ensuring the circulation within the internal market of drugs, of pharmaceuticals that are both safe and efficacious, that is to say they work, they actually do something. Clinical trials are aligned to that, uh, to that end point, market authorisation. The definition of clinical trials highlights this. Uh, one definition is found within that initial uh, directive, the directive I've just mentioned uh, at the start of this slide, as any systematic study of medicinal products in human subjects, whether in patients, 
or non-patient volunteers in order to discover or verify the effects of and or identify any adverse reaction to investigational products and or study their absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion and that's in order to ascertain the efficacy and safety of the products. So the criteria for market authorization are the core well, I think that's my reading of this of this of this um, definition. The definition of clinical trials makes it clear that the core focus of clinical trials is to meet those criteria, which are very particular and, as I will hopefully stress again, uh, quite particular and narrow. Now, clinical trials. So beyond the definition. It's important to note that clinical trials within the EU, uh, for phase two and three clinical trials in particular, are to be randomised control trials. This is as per uh, guidance provided by the European Medicines Agency. The guidance, incidentally, should be followed. It's, it's soft law, essentially, or it's, not, it's non-binding in and of itself, but it has effect because it must be followed in order to, in order to uh, obtain market authorisation, so it has hard effects. Now, randomised control trials, just to tell you, these are the gold standard internationally, and they're preferred then. This involves, then, and, and this kind of trial design, random allocation to either the test drug or the control arm of the study. And the control arm comprises either the best current, current treatment or placebo, and that will become important later on. Uh, just to bring out some more points and uh, a few more tensions, it's the quality, safety and efficacy of pharmaceuticals that, that is key to this regulatory design. The focus isn't on comparative efficacy per se, not necessarily in trying to ensure that new pharmaceuticals will be better, they can be really just more of the same. Nor is there an attempt to ensure that pharmaceuticals meet a genuine need. They can just be more of the same. And that may not be meeting a genuine need. Another important point to note is that the justification for trials on humans should be, at least according to the key instruments, uh, some of which I'll be noting on the next slide, I think, uh, should be about the improvement of interventions. It's about then trying to ensure uh, the meeting of or the perpetuation of the scientific enterprise. It's about improvement, improving things subject to ensuring the welfare of the patient, so there's an assessment of risk relative to benefit, and benefit must win out. Um, there must be some benefit there. All of this is necessary in order to justify re uh, the use of research subjects to research ethics committees. So this is really important. But as I do stress uh, again later on, and I'll just flag it here, I'll foreground it, I think it's to be queried whether or not the system actually is about improvement, I don't think it is necessarily about improvement. Um, and that, for me, means that actually the regime comes into some disrepute. Uh, it can be queried whether, uh, in, in respect of some clinical trials at least, perhaps many, I'm not going to qu uh, quantify, uh, whether they should be carried out at all. EU law then, in sum, permits and it legitimates the growing use of data procured often from vulnerable subjects enrolled in experiments that are increasingly taking place abroad, that is to say, outside the European Union, outside the internal market. There is, though, a focus, though, uh, on ensuring equivalent standards are abided by. That's a precondition for using uh, data procured from research subjects who are abroad. But the focus there is on informed consent of those research subjects in good clinical practice, as it is in relation to trials that are carried out within the EU. But this does raise some, raise some key concerns, and I'll turn to those uh, later. The focus on informed consent and good clinical practice, it's really, really important, but informed consent means a particular thing. I'll hopefully bring that out a bit more. Um, in, in the following. And these focal points then are drawn essentially from these international ethical standards, the Nuremberg Code in particular, so, um, coming just after the Second World War, and in particular the Helsinki Declaration, so that more particular uh, instantiation of the Nuremberg, Nuremberg Code in, uh, in relation to the medical setting. 
But overall, the dominant focus is on market optimization, understood as supporting co corporate profitability, but without significant innovation. And that engenders and is in, uh, underscored by some key concerns. So some key concerns in relation to the use of data derived from international research subjects who participate in trials. So just some questions. I ought to say here that what I'm doing is raising some questions. The answers are, I think, in the literature, in particular anthropology, anthropological work, and sociology. Uh, these are the questions, just to prompt your own reflection, but I think the, um, the findings are already actually pretty damning. Um, so do trial subjects have adequate understanding that the trial need only involve a random allocation to the new pharmaceutical or its comparator, which might be a placebo? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. That, can cons that consent can be withdrawn. It's not necessarily the case that individuals in trials, especially in the global south, will understand that their consent can be withdrawn at any time. That's because consent, our understanding of consent, our understanding of consent, doesn't necessarily travel well, doesn't necessarily translate to other contexts, different societies. Another question, can consent be voluntary when the experiment is effectively healthcare and the choice can be between, can be between something, receiving something, or nothing? In many of the places uh, where international clinical trials are carried out, individuals don't really have Oh, I don't think they have, and I don't think the literature indicates anything to the contrary, or at least the mainstream literature. Um, they don't really have a choice. So it's something or nothing. So that's, that's probably a blunt way to put it, but um, I think that brings out the point. Something else to note is, is the scientific quality of the trial, or its results. Now, that's not the focus of research ethics committees that grant ethical approval. Instead, they focus on informed consent and good clinical practice, but as I noted, the scientific enterprise, the generation of information, uh, scientific knowledge, should be about trying to improve the world, improve the options available in terms of pharmaceuticals. Now the move away from pursuing improvement, that focus on improvement in treatment options, undermines the justifiability of trials in the first place. That's an ethical issue and it ought to be something that ethics committees look at. Moreover, a clinical trial design can be tailored in order to produce favourable results. It can be actively skewed, in fact, to produce favourable results. For instance, using those who are so-called treatment naive, as many individuals in the Global South are, can help to emphasise benefits and mask adverse events. <coughs> Ultimate or most in need users might not be included in the trial if they are deemed to be less reliable at following instructions. But they might be the ultimate users, actually. The means of comparison might be selected deliberately in order to flatter the trial drug. So, for instance, the control might be a placebo, a sugar cube, for instance. Actually, when describing uh, this um, to students in, in class at Queen's, uh, I handed out uh, not sugar cubes, um, but sweets. Um, and we had a, quite an interesting discussion um, on placebos um, while eating, I think it was Haribo. Um, it, it made the point, anyway. There's another point to note, which is the exacerbation um, <coughs> of the results. Uh, or, or distortions in the results can be exacerbated by the underreporting of negative results, the multiplica multiplication, if I can say it, of positive results, inadequate peer, peer review in the journals that publish the results, as well as uh, journals that publish the results that carry out peer review that are actually largely obtaining their funding through advertising by the pharmaceutical industry. So that's a classic conflict of interest. And this is highlighted in the literature. I'm just distilling everything down. Now, placebo raises some particularly important and interesting points in relation to trial design. That's probably obvious given what I've just said. Now, of course, placebo use can be ethical, for instance, where there's no treatment for a condition or current options 
work but produce side effects, so we really need to try and develop an alternative. It's, it can be possible to justify the use of placebo, it can be fine. Now, as a matter of, this is, I say, EU law, broadly speaking, so this is guidance coming from the European Medicines Agency, that non-binding but has hard effects guidance. As a matter, then, of EU law, trials abroad <coughs> must use the same or similar standard of care and provide comparable treatment options. But the focus there is on similarity, comparability. The focus isn't on the same, or exactly the same. Now this means, it's, uh, well there's a question, is it acceptable to use local treatment options or placebo where the best global treatment is unavailable locally? There are examples of this in the literature. Uh, so this being the use of the best local uh, as the means of comparison or placebo, and this being justified ethically. Uh, you, might, you might query if that's really ethical. Uh, hopefully the example makes sense to you. Now, placebo use is really important, uh, just to underscore it in case it hasn't been made obvious, because it makes it easier to demonstrate efficacy. So in other words, that the trial drug works. So ultimately, its use is very, very, uh, its use is very, very useful. Uh, its use is very, very, another word, for market authorization. <laughs> it's very useful for market authorization. Placebo, the example of placebo, also underlines something else, which is the revisability of ethics in light of market needs. Now, I call this marketable ethics. I, I think, actually, what we can see in the following is that ethics are essentially reshaped, and they're actually made marketable in the sense that they are used to legitimate the EU's regulatory regime in, in relation to the use of placebo. Now, like the United States, the EU deselected the 2000 version of the Helsinki Declaration because it seemed to preclude the use of placebo where an authorised treatment was already available for use as comparator. Now, in the, uh, it was previously the European Medicines Evaluations Agency's guidance, uh, the following was stated, that although the declaration remains a vital expression of medical ethics whose aims deserve unanimous support, the EU prefers the ICH E10 standard which it produces in collaboration with its co-authors uh, with the United States and Japan. This permits placebo use and assists then production of data. I should just state, um, just as a, 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 an additional point, that the Helsinki Declaration was subsequently revised. Um, but the point is that when it, when it was, when it stated that back in 2000, this caused concern the EU's regulation detached itself, or the EU detached its regulation from Helsinki, preferring the ICH standard, which it co-authors then with the US uh, and Japan. And, and that's the situation today. The EU prefers uh, ICH. It makes mention of the importance of Helsinki. So it's important um, to, to note Helsinki and to say that the EU is in, uh, the EU system is in the EU's view uh, compliance with Helsinki, uh, and the aims should be worked towards, but um, yeah, there has been a, re a renegotiation of the relationship between the EU's regime and Helsinki. Now something else to note, uh, th 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 this is an additional point, is that the EU has done an awful lot, an awful lot of good work to promote trials for the treatment of under-researched diseases of poverty. Now this is just one example, this is the European, European and development Developing Countries Clinical Trial Partnership. So the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trial Partnership. There we go. It's about the power of sharing science, of trying to facilitate cooperation between the EU, uh, its capacities, uh, and developing countries. Trying to install infrastructures and expertise in developing countries. This is this one example of the EU's efforts. Now, it's done an awful lot of good work, and I think that's beyond doubt. But we should just query, actually, the value of this kind of work. Uh, in particular, we should query, okay, uh, that the EU has helped to install infrastructure and expertise abroad for pharmaceuticals that can be patented in the EU, but aren't necessarily going to be available 
to individuals in the places uh, with these infrastructures in place. Moreover, flexibilities, the flexibilities in TRIPS, uh, the public health friendly and human rights friendly uh, flexibilities in TRIPS, are being undercut by so-called TRIPS plus agreements, which are often part of EU bilateral free trade agreements. So the EU uh, and another, uh, it's typically a country, free trade agreements. The flexibilities in TRIPS that are human rights friendly, public health friendly, are being undercut by these agreements. So the EU is actively trying to undercut these flexibilities. So for me, that means that there's something of a contradiction, or there's a problem, there's a tension at least, that needs to be highlighted. Now, this infrastructure paves the way then, I think, for the wider use of international clinical trials data, but limited access and distribution of benefits to communities where the trials are carried out, usually in the Global South, and perhaps also to the trial participants, the individuals that provided the data in the first place. Now, I do have about five minutes left. I'm going to have to take some water. <laughs> There's not a, lot, not a lot more to say, so we're doing quite well. Now, um, I think to put it shortly, the EU does not provide equal protection for all research subjects. Uh, hopefully I've substantiated that to some extent, uh, or well. I hope well. Protections are flexible, they, the focus is too narrow and geared towards market authorization and ultimately product <coughs> safety. Something important to note is the use, uh, more broadly speaking, of this clinical trials pharmaceutical regime. Research in particular, including in health, is the driver for the production and exploitation of knowledge, making it, above all, a linchpin in making Europe the most dynamic and competitive knowledge-based economy. Now, that's a statement from the Lisbon Strategy uh, back in 2000, but it's essentially reinforced by subsequent uh, policy initiatives at what I call the overarching level of governance, so that at the political level, if you like, um, the steering level, um, for the whole EU ship, um, so that's reflected in Europe 2020 and Horizon 2020 in particular, so that those of you interested in research funding will know all about Horizon 2020 and how important it is. Well, if you want to carry out research in health, please bear in mind that uh, there's a very, very particular aim, aim for that kind of research, and it's market-oriented. Clinical trials are t also tied then, in turn, as part of all this, to the production and the legitimation of the European Union's broader socio-political order, and that's based on an innovative market-based economy, including a pharmaceutical sector, that bolsters corporate profitability, in particular at a time when cor corporate or pharmaceutical corporate profitability is, I don't know if it's hemorrhaging as such, but it's not as good as it was. Pharmaceutical companies have had fewer blockbuster drugs, uh, since the 90s. They need uh, to try and short their profitability. Ultimately, I think we need to understand clinical <coughs> trials, the pharmaceuticals re regime, as part of that project of European integration, although much contested. The way I see clinical trials and pharmaceuticals is as about trying to produce and legitimate that socio-political order in order to ultimately produce and legitimate a certain project of integration, to try and shore up the European Union, in, in, insofar as there is a European Union. Now, I think all of this is arguably to the detriment of public health. Uh, now, these problems, I think, can be ameliorated uh, to some extent by the revision of the European Union's uh, clinical trials register, so that it is going to be uh, revised somewhat, and I'm going to cut it short and say basically we're going to have increased transparency. So the data are provided um, in submissions to the EU's portal for clinical trials, that makes reference to clinical trials uh, carried out abroad, uh, that data must be registered. Uh, and there's some more detail there, but hopefully the slides will be made available afterwards so um, you, could, you can read the detail. Um, towards strength and protections then, that's where I want to go. And um, I, I've said all of, all of the above in order to try and 
explain why we need strength and protections. Now, in the following, I'm not really going to be saying a lot. I think, I think there's a, a lot more that needs to be done. Um, but I'm going to focus on some core, some core areas where I think changes can be made and can be made quite quickly. And to the benefits of those who participate in clinical trials, especially abroad or outside the EU. Now, the first point to note is that, is that it's too late um, in relation to the clinical trials regulation. It essentially duplicates what I've already told you, um, except in relation to increased or uh, improved transparency. So it's too late there. Um, but ethics and the focus on public health in the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights and, of course, in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union can be used to highlight pressure points or problem areas, in particular, then, to word it differently, institutional risks to produce risks to the EU's standing and reputation as an ethics and public health friendly regulator. The EU tries, and I think overall, um, is quite successful at putting itself or um, uh, portraying itself as that kind of regulator. I'm not in the business of trying to say it's not necessarily. What I'm trying to say is that there are some core concerns, and we can use this, this um, idea, this identity, and the importance of the EU's uh, sensitivity to institutional risk to try and make things better. One uh, area where uh, institutional risk can be uh, leveraged if that's the right expression, is in pushing for a wider notion of consent. So here I'm making reference to the work of, is it Jonas? I think that's how one pronounces his name. Um, so uh, who, uh, back in 69, where of consent as being wider than we tend to understand in consent, it's, uh, it encompasses a wider awareness of the purpose and value of the knowledge produced. So here, I think, making sure that those who are included in clinical trials, the clinical trial subjects, actually know, well, what use will this data be put to? Will it actually go to producing uh, pharmaceuticals that meet genuine need? That their commu the communities, um, the places where those individuals come from, will actually be able to access these, these drugs? Will that, will, um, will that be the case? I think that's uh, important, um, and it's something that is possible as a matter of law. Um, if, if we look at the uh, requirements under, uh, especially the clinical trials regulation, then uh, currently the directive, it's possible, I think, to read that into law. It's just a matter of practice, I think, as far as I can understand, that the way in which uh, clinical trial subjects are interviewed is such as to narrow the scope of the discussion. So there are some points. I think this is something that can uh, be changed, and it can be changed, I think, I think I'm right in saying, uh, by way of European Medicines Agency guidance. The, the agency, I think, really just needs to change its guidance. It needs to bring out uh, the importance of discussing these wider points. I think if clinical trials participants can understand risk and benefit, they can understand the wider use of the data that they might contribute. Uh, something else is the demonstration of comparative therapeutic efficacy. I think there should be more focus on comparative therapeutic efficacy. Whether the new drug, if authorised, if actually produced and authorised for market circulation, will actually be uh, at least as good, but actually will actually be better. Might it be better? There should be a, more of a focus on it being better, and actually more of a focus on it meeting a genuine need on doing some sort of public good. I think that, in, in addition, should become uh, the focus of research ethic, ethics committee work. Now, that's going to be harder to achieve because it's resource uh, intensive. And that goes into my next point, too. But both of these, these strengthenings of protections can be achieved, I think, by or through European Medicine Agency guidance, which, as I've said, has uh, hard effects, essentially because it must be followed. Finally, uh, so I've touched on patents, I've touched on TRIPS and the EU's uh, use of so-called TRIPS, TRIPS Plus agreements to undercut the flexibilities in TRIPS. I think that the EU should 
decouple patents for essential medicines from wider free trade agreements. I think they should be decoupled. What we have at the moment is, is a situation essentially where uh, countries are, one, um, shy about using the flexibilities anyway because they're afraid um, that they will uh, I want to use a more, I want to use coarser language. Um, they're afraid they will annoy uh, the regulators uh, in the EU, uh, in the US, and, and so on. Uh, but even if those flexibilities might be an option for them, they're being undercut where those countries sign up, or increasingly being undercut where those countries sign up uh, for bilater bilateral trade agreements with the EU. I think that should end. Um, so those are some thoughts on strengthening protections. I think uh, the, the, these points are quite complicated. They're joined up. Uh, but I think it's important to try and pay attention to the complexity and try and work on the different areas and, and, and try and make things better overall. There's doubt, you know, doubt there's more that can, can be said, but those are some candidates for improving protections um, in, in the immediate future. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, thanks very much to Mark for that uh, rich and thought-provoking paper. I've been asked to give a, a brief response, and I don't really have much to say in the way of like, critique or criticism. I agree with much of what Mark is saying and the, and the premises and the, he's working from the conclusions drawn. So what I want to say very briefly before I open up to questions is to try and uh, add some thoughts about what all this means for ethics and how we should understand research ethics, bioethics in the contemporary sphere. And as I understand it, uh, Mark's work is helping us to see that we, we are sort of passing through a, a historic transformation or a break in the nature of research ethics, the way that ethics apply to the research field. Uh, and so we, we're going through a break between traditional bioethics and law to neoliberal bioethics and law. I want you to explain a little bit what I mean by that distinction. So traditional bioethics, if you like, if you, if you look at the three big research ethics documents of the 20th century, so the Nuremberg Code, the Declaration of Helsinki, and the Belmont Report, which you could argue are the big three, these are fundamental to the way we understand the research project as being one which, is, which should have um, ethics and concern for the subject and their rights and interests at the center of, of concerns in the way we design and carry out the trial uh, and the purposes of the trial. And from these three uh, documents, I think we can get a view or a picture of a kind of classical notion of bioethics. So bioethics as a systematic method of inquiry about how we should live, how we should treat other people and why. And applied bioethics to flow from these principles. That bioethics is a, a kind of tool that we can use to reason in an ethical way uh, and to resolve substantive debates as to how we should treat other people and what values we should be pursuing. The, the case study that Mark looks at where um, big drug regulators are moving away from these ethics-centered documents and dropping the Declaration of Helsinki in favor of a more technocratic approach, I think signifies a shift to a kind of thin, market-friendly form of bioethics, which we can call neoliberal bioethics. And what are the characteristics of this and how does it contrast with the old system? So the new bioethics that Mark is talking about, I think, shows that law and bioethics aren't these, uh, a pure sphere anymore that's sort of um, looking down at society from a sort of elevated, lofty position. Law and bioethics are now increasingly intertwined with the logic of business and commercial interest, help, hence reflecting the change in nature. Law and ethics are also increasingly contested by different parties with, with different objectives in a way that those three big ethical documents weren't. Uh, and all these debates are, for the first time, unfolding against the context of a high-stakes business um, uh, uh, situation. And, and so commercial interests are now in the picture in a way that wasn't at all when we look at things like the Direct the Bureau Code or the, or the Belmont Report. Um, and neoliberal bioethics is also, it has this characteristic of, of uh, having a thin form of ethics. So, so it, it pays lip service to ethics, but it's in a kind of tick box approach. So do you have informed consent? Yes, you tick that box and it's ethical. Do we have research ethics approval? Yes, that it's ethical. But we tend to gloss over the structural inequalities that may drive ethics to poorer parts of the world and make that a, uh, uh, an attractive uh, regime. 
should we be surprised about this? In some ways, then, bioethics is just becoming normal, normalized in one way. So it's just like any other industry where the rules of the game impact on industry profitability and the survival of industry in some ways. So you see industry um, uh, contesting the legal standards by which it should be held in other industries like, well, anything you, you think of, so tobacco, um, uh, telecoms, finance. Industry is always uh, contesting the regulation and pushing for uh, rules that are more advantageous to it. So in one way, this is new for bioethics, but anyway, this is, this is a kind of an old story because it's just the same situation you see in, in every industry. Um, but either way, uh, uh, I think uh, this marks a, a historical kind of shift. I think we need to get more of a handle on the nature of law and bioethics and how they're changing. Uh, uh, and as Mark suggests, it's interesting for people in, in law to connect with people in other disciplines like anthropology or sociology or STS uh, in order to um, get a richer and more sophisticated understanding of the dynamics driving the field and solutions to make the world a better place.